Well, next class. Next Hope class. to next see class. you all okay. in class next class. Oh, well. Thanks for screaming. It's lonely in here. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, also. That's funny. Nick told me this class is mandatory today, and he's live streaming it. I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought today oh, was you checked it. I guess that was Nick's uh, trick on me, right? <laughs> well, we get to read first. Yay! Oh, well. Okay, good. Let's see, we got that, we got that. What should we speak? Let's just let's just start with reading stuff and then we'll uh, we'll go on. Oh yeah, and that's that's another example. Who wants to read their uh, their package? I'll go next. Okay. After After who? Cedar wants to go first? Okay, great. So I guess in reading these we'll 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 follow the, the video side, so you can just read the, the talk side. <laughs> All right, shoot, Cedar. Last November, a divisive election caused uncertainty for many in America. For a longtime resident of Marin County, it inspired her to act. Uh, TV One Cedar Bank says the story. I'm here in Sausalito, standing just outside Studio 333 on Caledonia Street. This is where Lisa Bennett runs a political action group. It's a new home for the group, which has been active for nearly as long as Trump has been off in office. A former CFO, Lisa made the decision to get involved with activism after the election last year. Then, in December, former congressional staffers published The Indivisible Guide, a handbook for engaging in progressive activism from the grassroots level. It gave us all a strategy and tactics to use, primarily to hold members of Congress or elected officials accountable. Since February, she's used the Indivisible Guide and applied her past experience both as a CFO and as a member of her son's school board to run the Sausalito chapter of Indivisible. She prepares research and books speakers from other activist groups for the chapter's monthly meetings. Once they have their game plan, Lisa and her fellow activists get to work. Often they partner with other Indivisible chapters, such as Indivisible Sonoma and Indivisible San Francisco. Uh, we had a sit-in in downtown San Francisco at Dianne Feinstein's office to encourage her to hold the line against the horrible health care bill that they were trying to pass. The Indivisible network fosters this kind of collaboration between chapters. Indivisible Sonoma helped out by bringing its large membership, and Indivisible San Francisco wrote the press release. Lisa appreciates those connections with other chapters since keeping people engaged in, with her own chapter is not easy. A member who's been coming since the first meeting offered her take on why that is. The membership is never steady. It depends on the month. If it's the winter months, it's too hard because there are always holidays. If it's during the summer months, it's too hard because people are always on vacation. And people don't prioritize it. If they don't plan on going every single month, then they're going to put it off. Despite the challenges, Lisa remains undaunted. She and Indivisible Sausalito plan on canvassing in California's 10th district with an elections group called Swing Left. They hope to help Democrats win back seats in Congress during the midterm elections in November of 2018. For TV1, I'm Cedar Banks. More information about the Indivisible Guide can be found at www.indivisible.org. Well, that read really smoothly, Cedar. I thought that was really good in terms of being able to being able to follow the story. Um, I felt there might have been a way to say indivisible a little less. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it, it seems kind of long. Indivisible San Francisco, indivisible Sausalito. You might have just been at some point being able to say the San Francisco group or the Sausalito group or something. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but you know the the pace with which you read it and the clarity with which you know each of your sentences moves us through the story was really really great. Um, I felt also that I don't know I'll, I'm always feeling a little impatient if it's more than a you know it seemed like a long time to get to the first SOT. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, whether that could have been, you know, fixed just by throwing in like a very brief one early on or something. Yeah, I feel like that first section could probably be reworked and reordered a little bit, but I wanted to get the, um, the graphic up there of the Invisible Guide, too. Got you. So, yeah. Um, and it just worked before that SOT, but I'm sure I could have reworked it a little bit better, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that first part. That worked well. Are there other folks, other comments for Cedar? No? Looking good? That's pretty good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Very well written. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Balance. And this is this is your second source, Excel. Yeah. So that's uh, that's actually my mother. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah. She's been growing in the group. She's friends with the woman who runs it, and <laughs> her name is uh, completely made up. Her father, like her last name, Jolron, sounds French. She's not French. <laughs> okay. Her first name it's uh, it's pronounced Chelsea, so it's like phonetic. So the X is like a sh sound, and then LC, shell C. Okay, all right. Wow. I know okay. that one. Wow. <laughs> I was gonna say, I thought, I thought maybe it was like an abbreviation for wow. like Xaviera, Lucia, something or other. I don't know. You know what I mean? So shell C. That's how we yeah. should say it. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. And you, you don't actually have to name her in the script, right? So you didn't have to spell it out. No. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I, I did originally write it like, oh, you know, a long time member, I was going to say her name and then have the pronunciator there. But yeah. Just oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. The pronouncer. But yeah, you, I think you did fine like that. It was, it was, you know, good for all of us. All right. Folks just saying they're here. I think I remember your, your, comment your suggestion essentially let some of the video and let some of the graphics do the the talking as well and that way it's not like over overlapping or redundant yeah yeah that's true okay that's cool. Cool. one two who's up next jenny yeah okay. you're welcome to put it i'm going to read from my computer okay well i'll put it up so we can follow it it's always Every day someone misbehaves, armed with a camera and strong morals, Stanley Roberts, creator and director of People Behaving Badly, combs our streets for misbehavior for his Cron 4 news segment. Stanley is often deemed a societal crusader or a snitch. However, his true identity extends beyond any one episode. No one is perfect and no city is free of crime, from felonies to misdemeanors. Unlike other cities, if you're caught doing it around the bay, you might gain some unwanted airtime and fame. While one person litters, a driver speeds. In the Bay Area, there's a watchful eye monitoring these misdeeds. No, it's not just the eyes of those nearby. If you're lucky and happen to be in the right place at the right time, Stanley Roberts may be a missed one of many spies. Here's Stanley Roberts, who found some people behaving badly. Well, just seeing the stuff that goes on in the, uh, seeing the segments that are going out here in the world, a lot of times they're not addressed. So my thing is to address them and look at them and look at things most people don't look at and people wish they would. So there you go. Illegal dumping is a major reoccurring issue Stanley addresses. One such case involves self-proclaimed donations tossed by dumpers outside a thrift store. 100% of the store's proceeds benefit the Peninsula Humane Society and SPCA. It's issues like these that can tug at one's heartstrings, but can also tear up one's heart, too. Outside of drawing audiences with cuteness, outrage, or shock, there's always a larger goal Stanley aims to achieve in speaking to one of, in speaking to one of Stanley's friends and colleagues, I was schooled about the larger picture. People of certain areas are most interested in what's happening and what's affecting them in their neighborhoods. JR explains it's a matter of civic engagement and empowerment. Most people in those areas get a step closer to getting those problems fixed on a legal basis when it comes to illegal dumping. That may mean city crews coming out there and cleaning it up for the time being and officers keeping a close eye on that area and make, making sure that people don't keep dumping out there. In these cases, Stanley is a crusader. On the contrary, if caught, Stanley is what some would call a narc. He could do this segment for another hundred years and he's going to get called out by people for being a narc, for being a tattletale and that comes with the territory. 
From thank you messages to being called a effing narc, JR reveals that people have relayed gratitude and pure hatred and insisted Stanley go deal with his own problems. In either case, JR explains that it comes with the territory. Whether it's a case of being naughty, narcissistic, or nice, when it comes to people behaving badly, the perspective is in the eye of the beholder. Nice. You know, I think I still wouldn't even dare say effing in that case. No, because I, I bleeped yeah. it out. I, I, and also oh, did you bleep it? Yeah. I'm quoting, no, wait, I think I have to look back at the video footage, but I think he went ahead and said effing to really just, on one hand, relay it to me without literally saying effing. Yeah, of course. So, of course. because it's a SOT, and I also learned from my first one, don't go ahead and fragment it because it's an SOT, unlike in print, where you can fragment it. Right, I've got it, yeah. So I was putting in the entirety of it, whether it be, if it's his statement, say, from the first, from the start from, to the middle section, or from the middle section to the end, put in the entirety of it. Got you, okay, because what I'm seeing is here, it's as, as scripted, it's in the VO, and uh, so in the SOT, he has said yes, the he, NARC, he said um, narc many times, and then gotcha. I'm, I'm paraphrasing yeah. him, except for the point where I get to the quote. Gotcha. So you need to consider, by putting effing into the evening news, what does it get me versus what could it cost me? So that's it. You may just find that you know uh, listeners are turned off by even the implication of an f bomb, uh, versus you know the question then becomes is it is it worth it? You know to me. Basically. Even though it's effing as opposed to, I yeah. mean, you're censored by, on mainstream yeah. media. No, I, I agree again. It, 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 I can see that it, you're, you're saying an F, you know, like I do with my kids. It's not as bad if they say effing instead of the full word. Uh -huh. But it's still a question as to, since you're bringing up the word and everyone knows what you mean, is it worth it? You know, the potential, the potential offense that somebody might take, okay. you know, what does it add to it, basically, okay. you know. Uh, but that's a really minor detail. Okay. You know, again, I, I really like, especially the way the anchors lead in and your lead are, um, are written here. You know, they're, they're, uh, they, they imply a lot. They're kind of arch. There's a real voice here, you know, which is uh, no one is perfect and no city is free of crime from felonies to misdemeanors. Unlike other cities, if you're caught doing it around the bay, you might gain some unwanted airtime and fame, you know. So it's 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 arch, you know. It's kind of uh, you're you're uh, you're skirting around the idea that you might be called out on camera and kind of shamed, held up for shame, you know. Mm -hmm. You're you're saying it in a little a little more uh, um, indirect way, mm -hmm. which is it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> That's a very detailed video description. Where the descriptions? That first, yeah. Uh, Compared to others in this? Yeah, you could make them lighter if you want, Jenny. Because, oh. again, just on the uh, understanding that, I mean, these are just supposed to be indications for an editor or something. So uh, how, how would you recommend I make that lighter? Because, I mean, as, as in the description, it's very detailed to show that I'm trying to do, uh, as if I were standing there doing the B-roll, I'm doing like a 180 shot trying to catch people doing some of the naughty behaviors. You know how this would go in news would be simply, do they have an establishing shot from the Embarcadero with the Bay Bridge? You know, that's it. They'd probably pull it from a library even. So you wouldn't have much control about somebody throwing a cigarette into the bay or a car speeding through or such. Okay. Uh, you know, they, they'd probably have a reel of <clears throat> things that you could use there. But, you know, I mean, so you could even abbreviate the b-roll by saying uh you know um, se several shots of people transgressing or something like that you know um <clears throat> and then leave it up to the editor to decide that okay because you couldn't go out there and specifically get it if you wait long enough you can <laughs> right yeah so you rarely have time to wait you're usually running to do something else yeah. okay so n no need for uh, inverted commas or quotation marks. That's these are. I mean, these are just tiny little things. Okay. Yeah. Inverted commas. I, you know, I don't know what to call them. I guess they're quotation they're marks. They're quotation right? marks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So get rid of those. Yeah. 
inverted, I'm like, what are inverted commas? Oh, uh, let's have a look. Maybe a, something else? I'm not even sure. <laughs> because inverted it's because it's marked as the SOT, it's indicative that Oh, it's British. So that's just, oh. up in Canada, that's what we call quotation marks, I guess. That's why, because Canada has a lot of, like, British stuff. Influences. Yeah, that's why. So. Quotation marks. Well, now I know I can stick to quotation marks. Welcome to America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fresh off the boat. That's me. <laughs> or fresh off the airplane, I guess. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Where are we? Back we go here. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, again, the I still think that I mean, it's there's there's plenty of new stuff and things. You know, I still think stylistically you could simplify a little bit, especially as you, you know, I, I think these two sections that I like so much, the, the archness really works for you, you know. Um, later on, it may just be a little bit more, you know, just, just becoming like, let's see here. Illegal dumping is a major reoccurring issue Stanley addresses, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, you could come back and say, uh, um, Stan Stanley often talks about illegal dumping as one of the, you know, as, as, as a, you know, illegal dumping is a problem that Stanley often reports on or something like that. To simplify it and make it more conversational. Just more conversational, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, the content is great. It's just you could go through it one more time and look at it and say, you know, again, one such case involves self-proclaimed donations tossed by dumpers outside a thrift store. Um, you know, so... Uh, self-proclaimed because they believe they're donations right. but you're trying to underline that it's also just trash if it's right. not done the right way you know um so uh uh you know um again it's just can you find a way that that is simpler to say that that's all um and again looking at back down to your basic structure you know who, who does what um you know so you know uh, D dumpers, uh, you know, um, well, who, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm just trying to think of how to do this. Uh, people, uh, people leaving donations outside a thrift store uh, um, at the wrong time or, so, or could be, could be, you know, is, Which one? might just be dumping it in, in the same thing. I'm looking at the second, second sentence where when you say one such case involves self-proclaimed donations tossed by dumpers outside a thrift store. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of how we could turn that into an active sentence structure. And I, I guess, and, yeah, because, I mean, you're right. You, I am trying to say they want to believe that they're donating, but clearly if they're not following the guidelines, it's just simply dumping. Yeah, yeah. Got, and in fact, that's a real good start. For, you know, <laughs> write that down. That's, that's, yeah. Remind me, please. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, so, so, that's, um, so. <laughs> yeah. What did I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we review the tape yes. once, <laughs> once it's posted. Yeah, but you know, it, it could it could be. I mean, this is the way it is. You're just looking sentence by sentence, and I think you found certainly better than anything I was trying to do there about how to how to untangle and make it make it simpler and more direct, basically. Yeah. Okay. JR, so did you actually seek out JR and got, yeah, fantastic. Good job. And I was impressed there. JR is giving us some sorts of, um, you know, he's clearly a news, a news person because what he's saying is that, uh, you know, uh, this type of show catches people because it deals with their concerns, like what's going on in mm -hmm. their neighborhood and stuff. So it's, that's, if you remember FOCI, F-O-C-I-I, -I, you know, that's kind of immediacy. It's like, yeah, the, the, the appeal of this type of show is that, you know, it's so local that it's your neighborhood. It's like the bad stuff that you're fed up of having in your neighborhood. So that's what JR is kind of talking about. Civic engagement and empowerment. Okay, those are cool. I, I mean, mind you, both the original interview with Stanley and even the interview, this recent one with JR, mm -hmm. they extend anywhere from 20 plus minutes. Yeah. So I'm being very like select. One little sound bite you're yeah. pulling from it. Yeah. Good job. It's a lot of work. Um, yeah. And, and then the, um, otherwise, the one last thought is just that uh, both here in your uh, taking extra care to present 
a negative view of what Stanley does. You know, and, and also up in the beginning, you also um, say that, um, you know, uh, where is there those? You know, there's definitely at the end, and there's another place where, where you, you know, you, you kind of point out that it's like Stanley might be viewed as a narc or Stanley might be viewed as a guy doing good. And I think if you, you, you could maybe bring that up once, but there's no, I was just wondering if you felt you needed for, in terms of objectivity, to say that, um, that, that Stanley could be viewed both as doing something good or as, you know, being a narc or a meddler or a snitch or whatever. So maybe so the good. last VO I would focus, because I was asking him as a second source, tell me, Tell me what you understand. Tell me what you've learned or have managed to gather about people's perspectives on what he does in his work. Mm -hmm. And essentially, he was backing up what Stanley was telling me. Some people see him demonically, and some people see him with actual great gratitude because right. he, is kind of, he is helping the community. Mm -hmm. And JR was telling me the same. Yeah. So I was kind of trying to like bring about the round the I guess you could say I was really honing in on the balanced perspective. Yeah. The, that's why I ended with it's in the eye beholder because the first one I remember I, I said don't judge a book by its cover. Gotcha. So I mean that's what I understood and it felt like because you're profiling him I think it's a great thing to bring it up at one point. I don't know if you need to go back to it again. Um, you know in the, in the sense that at a certain point I think you believe that this is you know there's some value to what he's doing, and so, so I think maybe you just leave it. Get rid of the, the first part and just jump into JR reveals that people have relayed gratitude or pure hatred. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea, you know, and so that you, the, you hang on to, yeah, JR's, JR's perspective later on and take it out of, because, you know, in, the first time we see it is, is really in the intro to. Snitch. Yeah, there. Okay. Um, so leave it from JR up until territory for that second to last VO. Yeah, I think so. Okay. You know, and, um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Naughty, narcissistic, or nice? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, there's worse ways to get an audience on TV. <laughs> Maybe while JP is getting uploaded, Corey, we could hear yours. Local schools are receiving help from a unique source, and Jefferson High School in Daly City was the latest to receive such help. Body slams and headlocks are not words typically associated with a high school gym, but Jefferson High School is the latest school to host all pro wrestling's gym war show in efforts to raise money for the school. Fans started lining up early as they patiently await to see their favorite professional wrestlers take to the ring and inflict some bodily pain on each other. I'm here to see Reno Scum, Will Quavez, Jeff Cobb, I'm a big fan of his. But despite all the pain being produced in the ring tonight, APW will be providing some relief to the students of Jefferson High School. One third of the proceeds tonight will go to the school. We break them off of breakup tickets. They sell them throughout the school and the community. They also keep all concessions, like any concession money that made tonight, water, soda, snacks. That's all going into the pocket of the community. In fact, this isn't the first time APW did a fundraising type event. APW has helped raise money for Clayton Valley Charter High School in Concord, James Logan High School in Eaton City. And their first show they did for fundraising, the Bayshore Boys and Girls Club in San Francisco back in 2014. Um, let's see. The Boys and Girls Club really opened the doors up for us, and they were able to, able to raise a few thousand dollars for a community that had absolutely nothing. Now you see a lot of these kids with new sporting equipment, kids going on field trips and stuff like that. We had APW do a fundraiser for our Ballet de Focolor de James Logan, uh, a dance group focusing on Mexican folk dances, and we were, and raised just over two thousand dollars for our group. Now, just because this is a local community fundraiser, don't expect lower tier performers. Some big stars that formerly performed with the World Wrestling Entertainment will be performing at Jefferson High. Uh, this is the first time in over a decade that Joey Mercury and John Morrison are teaming up together. It's a big deal. 
while working with the WWE, I had wrestlers like Matt Hardy and Jamie Noble come up to me and talk to me about the show. So if they're talking about it, it must, we must be doing something right. In fact, the main, the main event tonight is for the APW Universal Championship featuring two up-and-coming indie wrestlers, the champ Jeff Cobb versus the challenger Willie Mack. We're just trying to put on some world-class wrestling where at the same time putting money back in the community. APW will continue to put on the shows as long as they have a strong base. So next time you hear of a Jim Moore show being put on, come on down and check it out. You'll, you'll be helping out the community and who knows what big names will be stopping by. Next. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Uh, so don't forget your lockout. Yeah, I was confused about that. I, I thought, yeah, I thought, maybe I was confused with this in the last one we were doing, the VOS. The Mossad, yeah, right. So, but this one, since in the package, you'd have a lockout. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that, yeah, and the other thing is, uh, I'm not sure, I maybe let this go on a couple others, but um, when moving from the anchor to the reporter, uh, you know, let, an let the anchor give a little intro. Yeah, yeah okay. you know, Corey's, Corey's got the story or something like okay. that. Um, that's nice. So, uh, you know, again, th there's, uh, there's a very clear point to this story. You know, it's an interesting event, plus it benefits the community. So it's hard to go wrong with that. And again, you know, you've got, you've got that information out there and it's really easy to grasp. And uh, um, the, extra, the extra source here uh, you know, From the, uh, works, Logan. Yeah, it works well for you because it kind of expands on the benefit to the community side of it. You know? yeah, I was trying to get in contact with the principal of uh, Jefferson High, but he never, ever emailed me back. So. Well, I mean, this one works, you know, I, to me, the default would have been, you know, like, is there a fan who was there who could have said, man, this was yeah. fun, you know? Yeah. Versus in this case, I think it, 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 it works well because it's... Um, showing something else. Yeah, exactly. It's showing more of the benefit to the community, which, you know, I, again, it's, it, it's emphasizing why this is newsworthy and good. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, and in general, you had it in kind of present tense and upcoming, the show tonight uh, yeah, or might, something. Yeah, so that was real good. But the first, there's somewhere in here where it's kind of past, where you'd want to, uh, as they patiently, oh no, this is good. So this is like present. As they patiently await entry to see their favorite professional wrestlers to take to the ring and inflict, inflict not inflect. Oh, no. So, um, but, but it's nice, it's present tense there. But I think in, You could find a way around putting that into the past tense okay. there, you know. Um, whether it's just saying Jefferson High School is the latest school like to host. The latest to receive help. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. But, uh, so that worked out well. Um, I mean, putting it all into present tense. Yeah. And in general, yeah, you know, it's written very, uh, very active, and um, so no problems there for sure. Uh, I might maybe the second time the organizer comes back, Mac. I guess. Yeah. Mark. I might. I might at one point introduce him again. I, mean, okay. I know you've got a super on him. Yeah. Without, without, um, you know, uh, without in the audio side setting setting up his his actuality. That's okay. But maybe since he comes back again. You yeah. Know, you could. Kind of comes in. And out. Could, yeah. So you could do that a second time or something. I don't. Know. Maybe it's just personally me, but sometimes. When I'm watching um, reports, and if I missed who was talking the first time, I'm like looking at who is this person? Is it, anyway, yeah. is it? So that might be good, but that's that's real good. That's All great. Right. So so folks, just in general, remember when you move from the anchor to the reporter, uh, you know, cue that to us. Let us uh, you know make us understand that Corey Smith is uh, there with the story or whoever your reporter is. Okay. All right. JP, did you upload yours? Yes. Awesome, awesome. And here's the Pumpkin Brigade. It's here, and <laughs> show us what you did. That's pretty amazing. We had uh, Hubbard was another pumpkin. He was actually a Hubbard squash. Hubbard was running away from the cannibalistic pumpkin, but I couldn't carry all of it, so. Uh, we tied for first place. Way to go. As far as I'm aware, we won the tie, which was just a screaming contest. 
or loudness. Okay. <laughs> but then after both teams were yelled out and some silent debate happened with some people off in the distance, Team 4 took first place officially. Wait, but what? that was not us. We were Team 5. But we tied for first and then took seconds after some confusion. Way to go. And that is, that is a beautifully carved pumpkin. My Thank goodness. You. It's a lot of fun. The first out. story on KCSF is how we, uh, the behind the scenes of what really happened in that conversation. <laughs> we want to know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know. Turn off the cameras. It will come down. But we got two service hours. So that's good. Yeah, two is two. I thought you were supposed to get like nine or something. Or well, that's when you were. Two service hours and then you could earn five if you won the competition. So I don't know how that'll hash out since we didn't. Officially. Right, I get it. I get it. We had tied for 115 points with the team that was right next to us. They brought a lot of extra props, so theirs was more vibrant. Oh, okay. Ours was definitely more detailed. And it's beautifully done. Beautiful. I mean, really. How many people were carving that? We also had half the members they did. So. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> wow. You got to find a good place to park that pumpkin now. You gonna put it outside the van, or what are you gonna do? With I don't know. Yeah. I can put a candle in it, I guess, and throw it out there. All right. I don't, All know right. How, I don't know how the neighborhood will feel about a guy passing out candy from the van. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Awesome. All right, we're gonna read JP's. Last month, a street fair celebrated a neighborhood's revitalization, where JP Mackey has a store. Carlos Munoz was invited to a street fair in Hunters Point by friends who lived in the neighborhood. So he brought his baby son, Maxwell. We want to make sure that our kid, our baby, socializes, sees the environment, he gets to meet new people. You know, experience what it is like to be at a fair. The launch is the first fair, street fair, organized by the San Francisco Shipyard, a housing community developed by Lenar Corporation Five Point Holdings. Kofi Bonner, the regional president of Five Point, Northern California, states the fair doesn't just honor a long state tradition. In this inaugural event will celebrate and honor the past, present, and future of the entire neighborhood. The company's plan to build 12,000 homes in both the shipyard and near Candlestick Park. Prices will start at the high 500,000s. A number of visitors, Mika Payovich, admires this prospect. You know, people seem to really enjoy being here. There are lots of families. The development will include 300 acres of public space, 500,000 square feet of retail, and 3 million square feet of research and development. Carlos Munoz views this as an example of maintaining a community atmosphere. It probably helps build that community environment you're trying to instill in your kid, you know? The first few hundred guests to arrive at the launch receive free food and drink vouchers. Lenar presented me tours of homes still under construction, an ideal fit for Australian couple James and Caroline Sane. We were interested in house and kitchen design. Like any street fair, the launch featured artwork, food trucks and vendors, alcohol beverages, and of course, music. Guests dance while wearing headphones and watch live performances by the bay. Several visitors looked forward to hearing the headliner, Miami Horror. I was invited by my children to come along and watch the band, I thought, why not? And also the band is Australian, and I'm Australian. In a press release, Five Point states that the goal's fair's goal is to entertain, educate, Fire and embrace. When I asked guests if they would attend next year's street fair, they all said yes. From Hunters Point, JP Mackey, KCS 7 News. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I don't have much to say about this. It really goes well. Um, both the visual and the audio as I was watching it go by, it's just really totally understandable. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, doing what you're doing, it's great. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, the more, the more I hear it, the more I'm kind of thinking around the edges of it going, okay, uh, is it, is it all great or is it motivated by, you know, obviously they won't, you know what I mean? I, I feel like asking critical questions, but because they wouldn't engage with you, you can't ask them, you can't do anything. And in a way, that was sort of what they wanted, right? They wanted, they were afraid that you were going to come out and say, well, is there affordable housing here? Uh, we're here in Hunter's Point. How come 
you know, there's, there's nobody who lives around here could actually afford the 500K for the entry level unit. They were afraid that you'd be asking them that. I, I guess I'm just saying I'm kind of frustrated, but given what you had, this is really well done. Do you feel frustrated by that at all, or is it it's cool? No, not really. All right, so certainly wouldn't want to push you to dig around where you know you, you're not inclined to dig because this is just fun. <clears throat> so when it comes time to do the web, I don't you're you know you're you're looking for more context still, but uh, you know it's a geographical area, so I think already you could help people localize where it is and stuff. Possible, but uh, I don't know. Is it, is anybody else like wishing that JP could have been able to you know get more direct information from them and ask them more you know more community oriented questions about? Yeah, or, I, mean, I definitely think it's a little strange that they then you know want to sit down with them based on you know like that that them thinking that they might have been thinking like oh they might have been asking these questions let's like, let's not even you know. I, don't know. I think they were really worried about that. And of course, I think it's almost without a doubt that they, well, almost without a doubt, I mean, I'm pretty certain that they just didn't want to, you know, have someone ask them, well, what about, you know, affordable housing and all the rest of it? I mean, they probably had an answer for that, too. Do you know if there's any affordable housing in the project? I mean, is it? No, I don't think so. It's just like, it doesn't like, it's pretty much like gentrification. You see, that's what they were afraid of, someone yeah. throwing that, you know, at them. And I guess they didn't want to even... It's a hot topic. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And they're probably, they're probably afraid of that. But It does make you want to get it, though. True. You mean it makes you want to ask about it? Yeah, it makes yeah. you want to get to those people who won't talk to you. Yeah. Like, why won't you talk to me? Yeah, well, I mean, JP was even asking them at the fair, and I guess they weren't telling you anything else. Yeah. from Lennar who were there. They'd probably been told, don't talk to anybody about this. Um, Three million square feet of research and development. I, I guess that's office space, research and development. Yeah, office, office space. space. I should have put that. That's the only thing where I had like one little question and then right away you can, yeah, of course that's what he means. So that was, otherwise, yeah, it's really, really tight. Cool. Well, let's see. Uh, Kanata, do you want to read yours? Well, I have a problem at the end. Oh, OK. Still working? Yeah, I still work. OK. And Kyle, we know you're still working on yours. Right. You were supposed to be carving pumpkins. I was. <laughs> That's done. <laughs> but nice that you came in after. Yeah, I figured I'd feed a few people if there was anybody here from the group or anybody online from the group. And then I can't start to hear what other people write. Good work. <laughs> Okay. Also, one more thing, that poker chip was actually the food and drink voucher. Oh, let's the thing come back. I was holding. Oh, okay. If anyone was confused about it. Got you, okay. I, sh I wanted to say in the shape of this poker I chip. I, oh, okay. I thought it was just like some one of the games that was there or something like that. Okay. Is, for my clarification, when it says stand up, is that supposed to be on the right column or the left column? I think that's the right. It's the right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But sometimes you could just write on cam as well, because the stand up is on camera. But that, that makes it more understandable. So people. on cam would go on the left? No, it could go, uh, it could go, it could, I it could go on the right or on the left. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the scenes from Australia. Okay, cool. Well, a bunch of us. I could see why there are a bunch of Australians here. Really? Miami or. Oh, okay. The band and stuff would bring them out. Yeah. yeah okay. The what? Miami. The band is it's an Australian band, right? Yeah. yeah. That they had hired to play there. Money. Yes. What was the band? Miami Horn. Miami Horn. Yeah. Cool. Words on chat. Oh gosh, it's hard to read along with scripts because of the, of the screen resolution. Okay. Well, I guess we'll be getting the lion's share of scripts on Thursday. 
will be here. Okay. Cool. Well. So that that brings up a question. Yeah. When they're reading it for TV, they wouldn't actually be reading it from that two-column script format, would no. they? No. No. It would. You know, the prompter just has the the text that they have to read. It's a lot easier to. Yeah. Scan through yeah. That than and then when we were there at KTVU, they were telling us they have little pedals under the desk so they can control their own prompter like as fast as they want it to go and stuff. Oh. So they sit behind the desk, they just step on it, hit the accelerator to move faster or slower. And then, uh, yeah, so they, that, that's, that's how they'd be doing it. But they, yeah, they don't need the visuals. Um, but where the visuals, again, talking about the last visit to KTVU, where, where that stuff came in is um, when we were visiting the edit base, there was an editor who was like editing one of the packages. And so um, uh, basically the, the, uh, the reporter on camera, when, when we went through the edit bay, the reporter was reading the VOs. So the shot is basically she's she was just where the stand up happened and she's using like this you know a hand mic so it's you can't really hear any of the background so so you know they just the the camera operator just filmed her while she was reading the VO that she had written off of her phone so the VO was on the phone and she was just reading those segments and so that's what the editor was doing like basically the, the camera operator uploaded all of what they had shot and it goes to the edit bay and then the editor just starts with you know stand up and then they take the VO parts where she's basically looking at her phone and uh, he had his email open and it had you know the script of everything that she said in VO and I assume the next things that he was doing was just taking b-roll and like dropping it on top of the VO you know? so I saw basically that's how it comes together from the field so she, and in her, in her scripted version, it was single column, it wasn't two columns, but she would put in like just uh, shot, like shot identifiers, you know, like, cause she knew what they had shot. But then it was up to the editor basically to, to, to choose the, the B-roll that was going there. So it was, it was informative definitely to see how they, they work like with a, with a cell phone, you know. And all the VOs not done in studio, but right there from the field, just reading off the phone. And she'd written that. So pretty cool. I mean, pretty efficient. At the very least, too, it's keeping like I mean, you're not getting what you said, like a hand mic. You're not going to get a lot of the background noise. No, you're going to get yeah. some of the ambient sound that relates to where you've been shooting earlier. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And then the, again, it's such a rough edit job. I mean, they'll they'll. You know, when the B-roll comes in, often they'll have the sound up on the B-roll a little bit because it looks weird to have like a totally silent picture. So, you know, and that's more or less well edited. They go really fast usually, but they do put the location sound. So a little bit of noise from when she reads the VO is just going to get lost in, in the, the B-roll sound as well. It was interesting to see how they do it now. We used to have to bring the tapes back to the station, you know, so it was different. And the stand-ups, <laughs> there was a place outside the station with a bridge in the background where like thousands of stand-ups had been done just because it was like nobody had the time to do them on, the, on site. So they just, they had lights there already and they just do it that way. <clears throat> cool, okay. Um, so just a little bit from chapter nine, I get we won't even have time to do a little web quiz at, after next class. So anyway, we'll 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 review all the questions. Uh, maybe not next class when we'll be busy, but the one after that. Um, so once we've read your package version of these stories, we're going to rewrite them again for the web, and this will be the final time that you rewrite them. And next week, we're looking at the chapter on writing for the web, which covers things like, you know, when to use interactive features and like, you know, how, how they might improve your story. We'll talk a little bit about making a map or a timeline, depending like if JP's story is, you know, geographically located. So he might want to make a map. Somebody else may have a story that unfolds over years. And so you may want to have a timeline in there. Or there are, of course, lots of other, uh, graphic or interactive features that you can develop for the web. So 
a roundup of apps that might help you do that if, if you're doing that. But uh, again, you won't need to produce the web story for the web. You just come right out. But it's going to involve then changing the structure of the story because, I mean, web stories are basically print stories, right? I mean, they, uh, they're kind of print stories with endless amount of space. Uh, but uh, most of you guys have, you know, structured your story in the, the circular or diamond pattern of, of broadcasting, uh, where you may, you know, start with an incident and then go out to the bigger story and return at the end to an incident or something like that. Um, but in in moving to print, you know, that you're you're going to go to that inverted triangle uh, pyramid, inverted pyramid type of thing, you know, where in your, in your first couple of paragraphs, you're going to try to get as much of the summary information as possible and then move down towards the details. So uh, this may involve more or less of a rewrite of your story, depending on how you structured it. You know, but kind of the more classically broadcast you structured it, you know, starting out with some individuals, some, some very specific event, and then getting, you may, you know, you may be doing a more significant rewrite as you move to the web version. Yeah? When you're doing the inverted, how do you have like a lead that keeps people interested to go over the broad stuff first and then get down to this? Because the more specific you get and the more detailed you get, the more drawn in people are. So if you're starting Hopefully. in a really broad yeah. sense, how do you start that off to keep people interested? Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking, you really have like one or two sentences in which to make your, you know, try to hook people and give them the summary. So, uh, you know, it's sometimes a bit of wordplay to paraphrase Charlie Brooker. I mean, uh, it can also be a strong image or, uh, you know, cat creating a question in the mind of a, of a listener. So, not to do that though. Pardon me? Didn't, they say, didn't we learn not to do that though? Uh, we, we, we learned not to start with a question, like an, an overt question. Feel like having a, you know, a, you know what I mean? Yeah. Instead, it's rather tell them something which makes them curious, you know? Gotcha. Uh, so even, I think, was it, did Corey start his piece with uh, a question? Not with a question, but with uh, some, um, some sort of wrestling imagery, or maybe that was Nick oh, Winstead. You know, I, I, I do have some in there, but I don't start it out. You don't start it out that way. So maybe it was Nick Winstead who kind of starts it out, or maybe it was your oh, radio wait, feature? Well, no, yeah, I guess in the first uh, voiceover, there was uh, fans waiting uh, inside. There. But I was thinking right up in the lead, there was, I get maybe it's Nick Winstead who starts with, uh, you know, uh, um, so, some imagery that evokes like the wrestling match uh, before the in the next sentence going into um, closer you know into, into into your who what where why when type of how information summary um, let's just look here for instance I'm just thinking <coughs> back to NBC investigative um, but just basically looking at how they went from a broadcast story to um, something written out. I saw this um, on KTV, actually. This did you? Story. Interesting. I wonder if they have, oh, maybe, maybe they covered a similar thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty common, you know, in those, in those uh, morning editorial meetings, they go around saying, what's going on today? And, and they could send, you know, a bunch of stations could be covering the same thing. But Kyle, let's just look at, let's look at how this starts and then look and see how they adapted it to, to work in a kind of a print form. Because this is what we're doing coming up. Sorry, but we're, we're going to take your TV package and pretend that now we're going to adapt it to go on a website just like this, you know. Um, and of course, these are longer, so it gives them the opportunity to put in tables full of information, links, and such. But uh, let's just see how they deal with the lead. So let's see here. Oh, can I hear anything? Yeah. Sound is off. 
Sound is off. Uh, check the On video. video. On the video player? Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. It's originally referred to as the Tuller drill. Let's try this again. Don't drop this! Well, this is Human Factors Research, based on an, an original drill uh, by John Dennis Tuller uh, back in 1983. It was originally referred to as the Tuller drill. And uh, later it, it sort of got out of context and referred to incorrectly as the 21-foot rule. So basically what it teaches us or tests is a human factor re, uh, referred to as action, reaction, perception, lag time. So we all know that action is faster than reaction. And so what this tests is, what is the officer's physical reaction with respect to use of deadly force to a life threat? And so what we do is we compare distances versus reaction time, and we, we test the, the psychological and physiological aspects of an officer's response. And so what uh, Sergeant Tuller wanted to teach him is that distance versus reaction time. So the closer you are to a suspect, the more dangerous the suspect can be, especially with an edged weapon, and especially if you have a holstered sidearm. So he just used the 21 feet just arbitrarily to teach them something about the reactionary gap, which is distance versus reaction time. So the farther away you are, the more time that you have to react to something that the suspect does aggressively. Conversely, the closer that you allow the suspect to come or the closer you get to the suspect where you compress time and distance, the more dangerous it is for the officer and also ultimately the civilian that would attack him. Hmm. Interesting story. Well, I like to point out that gunshots aren't going to slow a guy charging like that down. Oh, interesting. A full-grown man charging straight at you. Hollywood has made you believe your guy blows backwards. Guy booking it towards you takes those gunshots and manages to put a knife if he wants. Ouch. Sounds bad. So, it's, I mean, unfortunately, we didn't see the package that aired here. Um, we got we got a good slice of um, you know of of the interview with great B-roll put on top. Very dynamic. Um, Cool. So, but what we have here at the top of the story, an NBC Bay Area investigation into the number of police officer deaths at the hands of suspects wielding knives or other sharp objects is raising serious questions about police training. Critics say a training drill called the 21-foot rule resulted in the unnecessary deaths of thousands of citizens in confrontations with law enforcement. Interesting. Okay. Um, not exactly a lead that's going to hook us, is it? It has, it has the information. Um, what's interesting is here, I think it's, it starts to get much more broadcasting. At an outdoor firing range in Corona, California, Dr. Ron Martinelli and his team scientifically study what happens when suspects with knives threaten police. That sounds like a better lead. It does, yeah. So what I was suspecting, and again, we may, I'll poke around and see if I can get what aired. But I thought is actually probably what aired started here. And they, in order to take the broadcast version and turn it into an inverted pyramid with you know, the important information first, they probably added this on afterwards. So this is probably pretty much what was in the broadcast version. And this is probably what was added. Look at just the length of it as well. These are two solid paragraphs. And when you get into the broadcast version, they're much shorter paragraphs, you know, much more concisely written. That's my guess, but we could look at try maybe prove it and check it out. Jenny? With regard to the inverted, uh, inverted pyramid, I mean, that is the traditional structure in, in print um, journalism and mm -hmm. taking Germ 21. I, yeah. Having regular practice with it. But as you scroll to the top, I mean, I'm thinking with my assignments and the way, say, Juan would grade me, he would probably still mark that really lengthy. Yeah. E even for print. Uh huh. I mean, would, would you say so? Well, well, the textbook says something like 30 to 35 uh, words per sentence there for a print. So. Uh, 
I mean, that's two and a half lines at 12 to 14. That's 28. Uh, it's almost, you know, 35. So I guess it's getting out there in terms of sentence length. Um, yeah, it's it's certainly lengthy. It's not very engaging. So interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, um, it's. Uh, not always easy to make your lead both interesting and informative. Um, but anyway, let you know I, we have a theory about this. Let's try to confirm that maybe next class or whatever. Find I'll find the the on air version of this. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see. So at any rate, uh, you know, regardless of this specific example, the task becomes taking something written for broadcast and turning it into an inverted pyramid type thing. Um, whether you can make an exciting lead in that, in that context or not, that's, that's probably a challenge. Um, I mean, you know, you just got to try. That's, that's the thing. Uh, cool. OK, so print writing, inverted pyramid. Requires you to write in shorter paragraphs. Jenny's talking about. You must strive to demonstrate objectivity. Nothing new. I mean, you know, again, what we want to do is, especially if it's kind of gratuitous, snarky commentary or something, it's, we're really, you know, and I don't think any, not, certainly nothing that we read today had that fault in it because we would have called you out on it. But, it, you know, it's, it's really like we're trying to, we're trying to sound, you know, Jenny even went out of her way to start to talk about how people might view Stanley either, you know, in, in one way or another. So demonstrating objectivity can be a good thing, but at a certain point, you're, um, you know, you, you have your point of view. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, once we, you know, when we get into this, um, you're taking your SOTs and turning them into quotes. Um, so kind of like, you know, you had an interview where someone said this to you live, then you wrote it down and put it in your script as though it was a quote, and now you're taking it out of SOT land and you're putting quotation marks around it and using that in your script. Um, and again, you know, uh, as we said before, but again, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Use, use your quotes just like you used your SOTs not to get the basic information out there, because you can do that fine. It's to give a sense of character, whether it's somebody saying something in a particular way, uh, or you know, can you get some emotion out of them? Can you, you know, so the, 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 the quote should be bringing something extra to the story. Otherwise, you can paraphrase. You know. um, so direct quotes are what we call the quotes where you're actually quoting verbatim exactly what they said, right? And so that would be definitely your SOT. And you're bringing it in with quotation marks around it. Um, and if you've chosen well, it's giving you the same value that it gave to your broadcast script. It'll give it to your web script, you know, it's if, or your web package. Uh, you're, you're getting character and specificity into it. So our indirect quotes, as you know, they're called in print journalism. So this is where you interviewed somebody and you take the information from the interview, but you don't actually play an SOT. And uh, when it hits you know, the print version, you don't have quotation marks around it. So this is where you may have interesting information, but perhaps it was said in an unwieldy way, you know, like uh, as Jenny learned, uh, and we all learned from Jenny's experiences, you know, you can't, you can't edit an SOT uh, as effectively because, you know, I mean, you can't cut out the middle of it just because it sucked in the middle but it was great in the beginning and the end you have to um, you know you have to either paraphrase which is a good thing so you can take the information and because it's indirect you're, you don't have to respect exactly how it was said um, or you know you can break up an SOT by a little you can you can inject yourself in there in a broadcast script but anyhow this you know a paraphrase from your script is often it's like an indirect quote so you can move that into your print version as well and usually you've paraphrased in order to take the information but do you know um, edit it 
more than you could with an SOT. And then a partial quote is where you kind of set something up and then you have uh, an SOT finish it for you. Um, so you can still do that in, uh, in, in, um, uh, in the print version of the story. In fact, it, it runs a little bit e uh, better than it's more difficult to pull off in broadcast than a partial quote is in, uh, uh, in print. So it works really easily in print. If you want to start a whole idea and then just finish it off with a memorable uh, you know, quote, you can do that pretty easily. Kyle, you had your hand up? So you keep saying print and we're talking about web. You're talking about print for web? Well, this chapter is about basic print writing. Okay. But since we don't, we're not going to adapt for print, but we're going to adapt for the web, which is basically same thing. Okay. You know? It's like, I, I mean, just curious. Yeah, exactly. Print a bunch, and then I know we're talking about web. So yeah. I wanted to. Like, so, like to me, this this is you know this. I mean, this is the web, but obviously there's a whole lot of writing, which is, you know, sort of similar to a, a print, like a newspaper story or something like that. Yeah. Like, good point. Yeah, definitely. So, so this is what we're, we're looking forward to writing. But uh, you know, here, for example, you've got a direct quote, right? Um, yeah, so again, these, these things seem pretty clearly to me to be taken out of, out of the broadcast story. You know, you've got, you got your VO, and then you've got SOT here, and they've, they've done it. Um, and the partial quote that you highlighted earlier um, or did you untie it? Yeah, no, I mean, we'd have to look through one no, here. You, you had it earlier. Did I? You, yeah. You, there you go. So the partial quote would be like after he said, and then quotation, a rookie cop might need 65 feet. Yeah, not the greatest example because really what this is is an SOT with he said and interjected into okay. the middle of it, you know. But uh, that, I mean, that shows you how you would rewrite, you know, an SOT for this. You do have to put in, you know, he said, or that kind of stuff. And of course, here you're moving into the past tense now because you're moving into print, too. So that's another thing. Um, and so partial quotes, you can, it's easier to do in, um, in, in uh, print. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So that's just basically a typology of quotes. And where all your quotes are coming from are typically either your SOTs or the stuff that you've paraphrased. You know, if it's a direct quote, it's coming from your SOTs. If it's paraphrasing, then it's what would be called an, an indirect quote. You know. mm -hmm. And so, you know, carrying those over into you know the next version is just pretty much understanding what you're looking at. You know, um, let's get to that story structure another time. But you know, the other thing is you you're um, you're looking at your video and you're saying now, okay. What was my video column telling people? Uh, and you got to look through it, and because you you know you, you don't have it anymore. Um, so, just if, for instance, your attribution ha has been done with a super, you don't have a super anymore. So figure out how to bring that information in uh, as you write the web version. Um, if you have particularly um, you know, if, if, if you have important graphics or visual information, people are not going to see that. So you have to bring that into your web version in a different way. So, uh, so you know, maybe let's say the first step is you go through the audio side, you pull, the, pull out your SOTs, you put quotation marks around them, you move your paraphrase sections in, in between those quotes, and then you go through and say, now visually, what do I need to translate? You'll have to describe it in your own words uh, and make it and put that into the story. Kyle, yeah. You already answered it. Oh, really? OK. I was just curious if we were going to visually write in like where we would put a video clip or yeah. a link to another source. Yeah. Or... Now, now, once you do that, then you look through it and say, OK, does this, is it really necessary to have all of this information? Or you know, then you kind of put your editor's hat on and look through and say, OK, I mean, it's good that we say that they're rubber bullets or paint bullets, but uh, we don't need to describe you know, the, the shell casing or anything like that, something like that. 
just, you know, once, once you get it in there, then edit it down and, and take a look at it. Anyway, so I, you, we, we won't have time next class to uh, finish up on this chapter, but next week, once we kind of get the ball rolling about doing the web adaptation, we can run through this, the rest of this chapter pretty easily. Okay, so Thursday we'll all meet up and we'll have more interesting Ooh. script readings. And stuff. Yay! So that'll be cool. Yeah, it'll be good to see everybody. Want some candy? Candy bars? Sure. All right.